everyone today. Wind me up. Turn me loose. Thanks. Well, good morning, everyone. It's good to be here. Hope you had an enjoyable Thanksgiving. I know I did. Before we get started, I wanted to let everyone know that next Saturday, the 5th of December, comes right between the 4th and the 6th, we're going to be decorating the church for Christmas, starting about 2 p.m., should just take a couple hours. You're welcome to come and join us. Help with that little endeavor. I can't promise a party. Um, I don't know what we're going to do. If we'll have anything or not. It's just a tough year. So we'll just... Let's focus on on uh, decorating the church and we'll see what happens. So this morning I want to... We haven't figured out we're stepping away from the Ephesians thing until after Christmas now because everything kind of got all jumbled up with Thanksgiving and over the weekend or this past couple of days, this message came rolling into my head and I thought, well, i got to do this one and then we only have three weeks until Christmas and so that's the advent that I'd planned and so it's like... I promise, though, other than other times I've stepped away from messages and never came back, we'll come back to Ephesians. Because we're just getting to the good part, so, the fun part, so, we will do that. So, (coughs) excuse me. If you're anything like me, I bet you feel as if this year, this season we're in, has come across as one big interruption. I mean, what, eight, nine, ten months ago? It's easy to lose track. We're, we're just getting started to what seemed like a promising year, and then, wham, COVID happens. And all of life seems to have been turned on its head. And, and it's unleashed a season, a life of unrest like we've never experienced before. I think there's a Latin term for what we're experiencing from what I've been able to research. It is um, coronus interruptus. <laughs> Certainly, our, our country, our humanity has weathered severe tests before. But this somehow seems different. 
almost dangerous. There are forces coming into play for power the likes we may never have imagined. And, and there's a tipping point, I think. And a tipping point that I feel we're about to encounter that only a movement of prayer and fasting will have an effect on. And I'm not sure the church has it in her to stand. I don't know. I hope I'm wrong. I really do. And we'll soon see, I think. But today, I want to... I want to turn our attention away from the big picture, and I want to focus on the individual. Bring it close to home. Here's the truth for you. Some of the most significant spiritual lessons are learned from the most unlikely people. And such is the case with our story today of, of Simon of Cyrene. We know very little about this figure who, like a, like a small drop in a giant sea of water, could easily go unnoticed. But what we do know about Simon should be enough to draw us in close and to draw great encouragement from, especially during these long and uncertain days that we're in the midst of. I believe Simon has much to teach us on what it means to follow Jesus in the great interruptions of life. So let's read his story. And as they led him away, they seized one Simon of Cyrene who was coming in for the country and laid on him the cross to carry it behind Jesus. That's it. That's the story. So, so what do we, we have here in this story? Is one simple sentence that actually tells a pretty big story if we look at it. We have a tiny little snapshot of one great big interruption. Here's a story of a man whose plans for the day and dreams for his visit to Jerusalem were, were completely interrupted and disrupted. This is a story that reminds us that we're not in, as in control of our circumstances and the times of our lives as we think we are. It's a story that reminds us that life is so precarious. It's unpredictable. I mean, just like Simon, here we are seemingly minding our own business, going about our daily life, and, and what happens? A million things can happen. Cars break down. Our health breaks down. An unexpected accident or diagnosis. And now here we are in one of the great interruptions in modern day history where so many of our plans and dreams and itineraries have been stalled, altered, or canceled altogether. So what do we do? What do we do? How do we respond to the great interruptions of life? This is where I believe Simon of Cyrene can teach us a great deal. There are some key spiritual lessons that we can draw out from this little story, but, but first I need, to, I need to paint the scene for you. I need to give you what almost every scholar believes is the background to the story. See, one of the things we learn right away is that Simon comes from Cyrene. In that day, Cyrene was a leading city in North Africa, which was most likely in what we know as Libya today. During that time, Cyrene was filled with many Jewish people who had been dispersed there for various reasons. And if you were a Jewish person living in Cyrene, you were living about a thousand miles from the center of all the action in Jerusalem. And they didn't have social media. You didn't have an internet to see pictures or videos. Well, there were no such things as pictures or videos. 
You, you couldn't follow hashtag Passover feast on social media. You couldn't stream it live and, and see everyone and all the happenings going on in Jerusalem. All you could do was imagine in your mind's eye from the stories of people who had been or maybe the depictions of the events in artwork. They also didn't have trains, planes, and automobiles. So to go there would have been incredibly expensive and arduous. Man's riding a donkey for a thousand miles. Many of these foreign Jews would have dreamt of the day when they could save up enough money and make this once-in-a-lifetime pilgrimage to Jerusalem to see it all firsthand. This was a bucket list item. Maybe you have a list of experiences that you want to have or places you want to visit before you die. For the Jewish people spread across the ancient world, this was it. To see Herod's temple in person. To be there for the great Passover feast. This was the dream of dreams. It's made life worth living. And we're told here that Simon was just coming in from the country. Here he is. He's finally made it. He's taking it all in. If you've done any traveling at all, maybe to, to some famous historic site, especially to a foreign country, you, knew, you know this feeling. It's the moment when you're finally there and you're, you're seeing it all with your own eyes. Oh, is it wonderful? I've lived my life to be here. You can't, you can't believe it. You're, pinch me. Am I dreaming? I'm here. It's surreal. So, here was Simon, wide-eyed, ambitious, probably with a whole list of things to see and do, and then he hears something. Simon hears this loud, wailing processional coming down the street. As it gets closer, he never could have imagined what would happen next. In the blink of an eye, his plans, his dreams, his whole itinerary is thrown out the window. Simon's life and legacy are forever altered as he's forced to carry this heavy, rough, blood-stained cross of a presumed criminal. So what can we learn from this? Let me offer you a couple of key lessons. I'd say the first is definitely the most important. You've got to become a Barabbas before you ever become a Simon. Or put it this way, you've got to see yourself as Barabbas before you ever see yourself as Simon. Well, what, what do I mean by that? Well, our story of Simon of Serene is encapsulated within a bigger story that is taking place all around our hero. Just, just before Luke gives us the details of our friend, we're, we're standing in the court of Pilate. And there's another man whose life is unexpectedly interrupted by the cross of Jesus. But they all cried out together, Away with this man and release to us Barabbas! A man who had been thrown into prison for an insurrection started in the city and for murder. Pilate addressed them once more, desiring to release Jesus. But they kept shouting, Crucify him! Crucify him! A third time he said to them, Why? What evil has he, has he done? I have found in him no guilt deserving death. I will therefore punish and release him. But they were urgent, demanding with loud cries that he should be crucified, and their voices prevailed. So Pilate decided that their demand should be granted. 
He released the man who had been thrown into prison for insurrection and murder for whom they asked. But he delivered Jesus over to their will. See, just like Simon, Barabbas also unexpectedly finds himself wrapped up in the story of Jesus. Here's this man in verse 25 who was guilty as charged. But what happens? All of a sudden, because of Jesus, Barabbas is released from prison and is free to go. I mean, I mean, can you imagine this? There you are, knowing you're guilty, and, the, and you're hearing the crowd outside crying, Crucify Him! Crucify Him! You're sure they're coming for you? They're crying for your death. And in a matter of seconds, your cell door is flung open and you're fighting back the tears and the fears knowing the torture is coming and awaits you. Then like a gruff bulldog, the Roman soldier says, Ah, you're free to go. Wait, what? Yeah, Jesus of Nazareth is taking your place. He's taking your cross. Now get up, get out of here. The story of Barabbas comes before the story of Simon because every single Christian is, in a sense, both Barabbas and Simon. And the order matters. Now, I know we're we're not told that Barabbas had personal faith in Jesus at this moment. My hope and my belief is that Later on, he did. But we can't miss that he's a poignant picture of what happens to anyone, everyone, who becomes a Christian. See, when a person becomes a Christian, he or she recognizes their guilt before the ultimate king and judge. Our cosmic treachery against God. And by faith in Jesus, we're acquitted, released, made forever right in the eyes of the true king, and we're free to go. Listen to the words of Wesley's famous hymn, And Can It Be? Long my imprisoned spirit lay, fast bound in sin and nature's night, but thine eye diffused a quickening ray. I woke the dungeon flamed with light, my chains fell off, my heart was free. That's Barabbas. But then it goes on. I rose, went forth, and followed thee. And there's Simon. Simon of Cyrene. In theological terms, Barabbas is a picture of justification. The one-time moment of being released from your debt and made right in the eyes of God because what Jesus has done. And Simon of Cyrene is a picture of sanctification. The long road of following Jesus in life. Barabbas is a picture that salvation is a free gift. Simon is a picture that Christian discipleship is costly. But you've got to become a Barabbas before you ever become a Simon. Simon. And I'd argue that if you can't see that Barabbas is a picture of what Jesus has done for you, that he's borne the punishment that you deserve, you may not be a Christian. Because a Christian is someone who sees both the gravity and weight of their sin and the gravity and weight of what Jesus has done for them. You see them both. You can see the ugly diagnosis of of sin, but also the beautiful cure of a Savior called Jesus. See, what is the cross? What, What was the cross? 
The cross in their day meant one thing and one thing only. It was an instrument of death. Punishment for the most heinous. But, as Barabbas, you die to every attempt to save your life. And as Simon, you die to every attempt at trying to control your life. You die to every attempt to save your life and every attempt to control it. All of us are called to relate to the cross of Jesus in these two ways. To first behold the cross and receive what Jesus has done in our place. Then to bear the cross and follow the Lord down the dusty, hard road of Christian discipleship. So before we go any further, I need to ask, have you done that? Have you done that? Can you sing, Behold the man upon the cross, my sin upon his shoulders? Can you see yourself as Barabbas? Guilty as charged, but forgiven and set free because of Jesus. You got to see Jesus carrying away your cross before you ever try and carry a cross. But when it comes to carrying the cross, here's the second lesson I think we can learn from this story. The crosses we bear often come to us as sudden interruptions. The crosses we carry are often sudden interruptions. The crosses we have to bear in life often come to us as sudden, unexpected Interruptions. See, we don't get to choose the crosses we bear in the time that we have to bear them. Again, we're told very specifically that Simon was coming in from the country. This is Luke's way of telling us that Simon wasn't part of the original crowd. He hadn't been a part of any of the happenings up to this very moment. He had no part in what was going on. All of a sudden, he's yanked by some Roman soldier. You, get over here. We read that he was seized out of the crowd and forced, forced to carry the cross of Jesus. There's no way Simon was expecting this. No way. It's not like he woke up and said to himself, you know what I want to do today? How about carrying someone's cross? That's what I'll do. Let me just add that to my agenda for the day. No. No. This wasn't scheduled. This wasn't planned. This wasn't even wanted. If he'd have been given the choice, he'd have turned it down because you can imagine how he must have felt disgusted. I mean, you realize this would have made him ceremonially unclean for the feast he came to attend. His reason for being there just went in the toilet. He's frustrated. He's angry. He's upset. He's annoyed. And it's in this moment where we cry out, why did this have to happen to me? Why me? We don't choose the moments in life we are called on to carry some heavy, painful load for Jesus. We don't choose it. It chooses us. Bearing our cross comes in many forms. It's certainly moments where we're mistreated and ridiculed for identifying with Jesus, but they're also, as C.H. Spurgeon pointed out, the hard providences of God that we're called to endure. And here we are. Here we are. It was a little over eight months ago where all of us were living our lives together, 
hanging out together, working jobs, making plans for this and that. Nancy and I both fought. we really turned a corner with leading this church. We were, we were going somewhere. We had a plan. We had leadership. We had, we had this thing gelling together as a family. We were, we were going to make it. What were we doing? We were coming in from the country. Coming into our own. And all of a sudden, were seized and swept up in all the losses and pain that this virus has caused. Or anything like me, the tendency is to be incredibly angry at this great interruption. To fight back. But see, this story of Simon is a picture of our lives. It's here to remind us that often the great crosses of life that we're called on to carry for Jesus are thrust upon us. They come come to us as sudden, unexpected interruptions. What's God telling us here? To expect the unexpected. To plan for the unplanned. Just as Peter said, Beloved, do not be surprised at the fiery trial when it comes upon you to test you as if something strange were happening to you. It's the way of the cross. It's the way of the Christian. It's the way of life. And as Christians, this isn't just a trial. We can know that it's a cross because God is going to use this to do far greater things than we could ever imagine in our lives and the lives of others if we let him if we release it to him we stop trying to control it what does Ecclesiastes 3 the great chapter in the Bible on time tell us about time that God has made everything beautiful in its time See, these times are not in our hands. They're not in my hands. They're not in your hands. They're in in His hands. The time is in His hands. And God promises to use the crosses in our lives to do far greater things than we could ever imagine. Simon of Serene had had no idea how this great interruption would change the course of his life and define his life and legacy. What did God do with this moment for Simon? God brought him face to face with Jesus, the true Passover lamb. He experienced a Passover he didn't think was possible. God used this interruption and cross to bring him close to Jesus and ultimately to bring others to Jesus. See, this this incident was with Simon is mentioned in all three of the Synoptic Gospels, one sentence. But in Mark's Gospel, he adds one small detail. And they compelled a passerby, Simon of Serene, who was coming in from the country, the father of Alexander and Rufus, to carry his cross. This means that when, when Mark was writing his gospel, everyone in the Christian community knew who Alexander and Rufus were. It'd be like someone saying today, and Simon, the father of Tim Keller, or John Piper, we'd all instantly know who that is. What this means is that most likely God used this moment to save Simon and then bring about a spiritual legacy of salvation in his own family as well. That spread far and wide. Because when Mark wrote his gospel, He said, the father of Alexander and Rufus, 
who would have been widely known and respected. How do we endure the cross? How, how do we bear up under the unexpected interruption with strength, hope, and joy? Do it the same way Jesus did. For the joy set before him, he endured the cross. You know the cross wasn't the finish line. There was a greater joy that awaited him. There's a greater joy that awaits us. Each and every one of us had to focus on that joy and carry the cross and endure the crosses we're given. We can have the joy of knowing that somehow God is at work in all of this. Even when we can't see it. Even when we don't know. We can trust that He's at work at this. That somehow God's going to use this cross to bring us closer to Jesus and to bring others to Jesus as well. It's got to be our goal. God is going to use this cross to bring many Alexanders and Rufuses into the family of God. Just like with Simon's cross, God is going to use this cross to write a far greater story than you and I could ever write if we had the pen and everything was going as planned. God's using the crosses of our lives to write a beautiful story. We may not see how he's doing it now, but one day we will. And like Simon, we will rejoice at the cross we never wanted. I want to close with a story I think encapsulates what I've been trying to communicate. Many, many years ago, there was a Scottish farmer who everyone knew as Farmer Fleming. One day, farm. Farmer Fleming is behind in his work and extremely busy, but he heard what he thought to be cries for help from a nearby pond. Now, he thought about just going on with his work. He had so much to do. But the cries seemed to be getting louder. So Fleming stopped everything and ran to the pond only to find a boy sinking deeper and deeper into the muck and sludge next to the pond with no way to get out. Fleming was able to rescue the boy and he took him to his home and cleaned him up, gave him a new change of clothes and then sent him on his way. His progress very much derailed for the day. A few days later, fancy carriage pulls up to Fleming's farm. A rich nobleman got out and told Fleming, it was my son's life that you saved the other day. How can I ever thank you? Fleming could not think as to how to respond, but standing next to Fleming was his own son. So the nobleman said, I'll tell you what, why don't you let me personally see to the education of your son? I have a feeling that he could be something great if he's anything like his father. Fleming agreed. And years later, his son graduated from St. Mary's Medical School in London. The farmer's son was Alexander Fleming, the man who would later discover a life-saving medicine called penicillin. The name of the nobleman was Lord Randolph Churchill, and the boy that was saved. Sir Winston Churchill, Farmer Fleming, Simon of Cyrene. They had no way, no idea what one big inconvenient interruption would mean for their family and mean for the world. But this is how God works. The crosses we, we bear often come to us as sudden interruptions. But what does God do? He, he uses those crosses to write a beautiful story. What if instead of looking at the interruptions we face in life as obstacles to avoid, we looked at them as opportunities to get closer to Jesus? 
to serve others in the strength that he provides. Fixing our eyes upon him who is with us and goes before us. Simon had come to Jerusalem for a totally different purpose. But he left, having encountered Jesus. Maybe, maybe there's a Simon watching this right now. Maybe a Simon jumped on the internet for a totally different purpose and stumbled across this message. It didn't just happen to tune into this. God wants to interrupt your life in the most beautiful way possible. He wants to use this message to free you from your sins like He did with Barabbas. And to encourage you that for every cross we have to bear, we can know that it is under God's loving, sovereign care. As Charles Spurgeon so eloquently preached, shall Simon bear the cross alone and all the rest go free? No. There's a cross for everyone. And there's a cross for me. Let's pray. Lord God, thank you for the beautiful stories that you write out of the trials and tribulations of the seemingly common man. I can only think and imagine that I would not have been as gracious and noble as Simon had I been called upon to change my life in a moment and carry that cross. But you know who's faithful and who's willing. And Lord, I thank you for your stories that remind us of what you do with those interruptions, of those terrible moments of our lives. And it's from reading those stories I can pray and I can hope that it affects me enough that my outcome would be different. Lord, I pray that there are Simons sitting all over watching this message and wondering how they can be used by you. Well, Lord, we know that all they have to do is live. To embrace the interruptions as they come. To embrace life as it comes. Stop trying to control it. Die to self and carry the crosses before them. And allow you to do the work. Lord, if there's that one out there that is wrestling with the choices in life and wrestling and wondering if there's any, any place for them to be rescued, Lord. I pray that they find it here today. And they will pick up your word and understand, like Simon, like Barabbas, you've borne the guilt of our sins. You've paid the penalty for our actions. All we need to do is accept the freedom you offer to pick up our cross, and follow Jesus down his dusty, dark road. Or we know that you have a destiny of joy and grandeur waiting for all of us. That is the hope we carry. And Lord, I pray that every one of us listening today would be able to find a way to share that hope with someone who needs it. That we live our lives embracing the interruption drawing near to Jesus and asking what can we do with this situation? How can we carry our cross into this darkness and rescue others? Leaving a legacy of Rufus's and Alexander's behind, Lord. Give us all the heart and the will of Simon to carry our cross, to bear this interruption for your glory. In your name we pray, amen and amen. Have a great week. Hope to see you soon.